All righty. Hello, everybody. Welcome out to our sustainability information session. We are so excited that you guys are here. Um, it really takes a lot to come out here on a Wednesday night, so I really appreciate you being here. My name is Kelsey Mack. I'm the environmental specialist with the city of Cocoa Beach. Um, I help oversee our sustainability committee, all of our sustainability um, initiatives. In the city. Sustainability committee is who helps put on these information sessions, such as the one you are attending, either in person or virtually as well. I wanted to let you know about the next information session that we have coming up. It's actually going to be on March 15th. See if I can get this um, right. I'm covering a topic ca called Restore I, Soon Inflow. Not, no, I, I, I knew it wasn't a spam. I knew it wasn't a spam. So, public library on March 15th. 6:30. Um, so if you're not familiar, FIT has been working on some research to um, evaluate basically here. inflow of ocean water into the lagoon and how that would impact the lagoon. Um, the organizers here to help possibly it's already started. Make sure that you log in for that if you're interested in hearing more about the lagoon. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce the gals here from the Sea Turtle Conservancy. We have Kathy and Rachel here tonight. They're going to be giving us a nice overview of sea turtle lighting and how that'll impact the sea turtles. Um, or how artificial lighting will impact the sea turtles. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to you guys. Hello. Hello. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Should I alter this a bit? Better? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Casey Hain. I um, work at the Sea Turtle Conservancy along with my boss, Rachel Tai. I'm going to do a little presentation today about sea turtles dig the dark. But um, are any of you? Okay. Um, I'm just going to give you a little background about turtle friendly lighting, um, what SCC is, and how you can help save sea I might need you to go to the next slide. Okay, so um, a little bit about the Sea Turtle Conservancy. Um, we were founded in 1915 by, uh, also known as the father of sea turtle research. Uh, we have worked in uh, the Caribbean, um, Nevis, Panama, Costa Rica, Fort Lauderdale, now Cocoa Beach, and Southwest Florida. However, we are in Gainesville, Florida. Um, we have over six years of experience in international education outreach, advocacy, and um, just kind of getting people interested in learning more about sea turtles. And if you guys have any questions at all, um, you can raise your hand. It's very informal. We'll have a question and answer session. Not might need you to go to the next. Okay, so um, Sea Turtle Conservancy's lighting team, um, Rachel Tai, she's going to be doing the second half of this presentation. I'm Casey Hain. I started with Sea Turtle Conservancy last May. Um, I previously to Sea Turtle Conservancy, I worked with the state of Florida doing statewide sea turtle lighting. Um, it gets really into policy and where your house is located. Um, Emily Asp, she is our lighting specialist. She does all of our code enforcement workshops. Um, we actually have one tomorrow. And then Stacey Gallagher works part-time as a lighting project specialist and part-time as a development coordinator. She works on all of our grant and where we get our money to do fun things like this. It says zero, zero, zero. Okay, so a little bit about STC. I'm gonna get into human populations and the use of artificial light. So if you all have worked with sea turtles, I'm sure you have seen light pollution and beachfront lighting and maybe wonder why sea turtles nest in the area, um, why they don't and where they end up, where they end up. Okay, so you can go ahead into the next slide. Does anybody remember Florida looking like this? Or have you always just seen it looking like this? Um, this is what Florida once looked like many, many, many years ago um, before the colonization of um, Europe and Native American lands and stuff like that. Nope, you can go ahead. So is this what we see Florida looks more like? Um, my boss and I, we were walking on the beach today and um, she was like, wow, look at all these people. And it's just crazy because it was 5 p.m. on a Wednesday and the beaches were still packed. Um, so we have our residents, we have our locals, and we have tourists that come even from um, other countries to come to Florida beaches. Okay. Um, so
So now the race to develop Florida's coast is pretty, um, pretty evident, but as you can see in 1964 in Marco Island, it was pretty, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Non-developmented. And if you go to the next slide, uh, this is Marco Island in 2017. So you can imagine it has only exponentially grown. Um, yeah, the next slide is gonna show some pictures of, I think of Miami. Yep, so this was Miami Beach in 1920. Have any of you ever been to Miami Beach? I have never been to Miami Beach, but I don't think I would like the next slide. Okay, so that's what Miami Beach looks like now. I think I would prefer the 1920s version. Um, So we wonder um, a little bit about where people in Florida come to. And with all of this development we see, where do you think that people would be living in Florida? Do they want to live in Gainesville? I mean, we do, we kind of love it. Um, although I would prefer to live on the beach. And as you can see here by these um, brightly illuminated polygons um, in yellow, you can see that those brightly lit areas are all around the coastline. You have. Pensacola, you have Southwest Florida. I mean, you can see Cocoa Beach, Melbourne, all the way down to Miami and the Keys are just, they're those large population centers, which then leads us to, this is what our coastline looks like at nighttime taken from space. Um, so it's just very, and what we're trying to avoid, most don't like white lights. Okie dokie. So this light, the source of light can be found in many areas. Um, this is a beachfront condominium. Um, you have their front of their building lit up. And then um, it also comes from single family homes on the beach. Obviously you want your house to be protected with light and you don't want trespassers, but also we are working together to keep that human safety along with the protection of sea turtles. And then we have these roadways. Nobody wants to get into car accidents. Um, and also it needs to be illuminated, but you also have your car headlights. And I don't know if any of you have seen, but there was um, a loggerhead. They end up in streets and pools and stuff like that. So there's, we're just gonna get into a lot of ways that we can um, mitigate these bright white lights. Also, um, a lot of people like to walk on the beach at night. It's romantic, take a long stroll, hold hands. Um, probably see some stars. Um, however, you also have dune walkovers. Sea turtles can get stuck underneath them when they try to not be able to turn around. Um, so there's a lot of different options that we can do when we do um, sea turtle friendly lighting. And then we have events like this. Um, a lot of these events take place during sea turtle nesting season. Um, and what I kind of want to elaborate on is like, it's not just this light, it's like layers and layers and and streets and miles away and light just accumulates and you know, a sky glow and that can also deter sea turtles so beachfront artificial lighting is not just front it strands whoopsie many 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 miles okie dokie um so all of this light um at night comes to the source so if you try to see the species in here you can see we have birds um we have i think sea mice we have hatchlings and then turtles coming up um, so you can see that we have the moon, which is where the turtles are supposed to go. And then you have your unshielded um, up lights and your unshielded pull lights. So a fun fact, um, not so fun, kind of sad, is that artificial light doesn't just affect sea turtles, it affects many other species. Um, this was some research done and it says tadpoles of the same age exposed to different nocturnal um, illuminations. The tadpole in A is from the darkest lighting treatment um, and it was metamorphosizing at its usual rate. However, the tadpole in B still remains in the larval stage because its body was altered by that artificial light. So it doesn't just affect sea turtles, it also um, affects like the human arithmetic or like your sleep schedule. If you're seeing like, they don't recommend you watch TV before bed because all that light just alters your human behavior. But it's sad because these are such small species that it, you don't think that it would hurt a tadpole, but it does. All right, so who loves sea turtles? Um, sea turtles are over 110 million years old. They're older than the age of the dinosaurs. Um, so I'm gonna get into some history about their nesting cycle, the species we have here, the amount of nests. 
So um, this is Archelon. This is one of like the oldest known turtles in 1933. You can see just how big they are, um, but it's kind of sad that human impacts, such as artificial light can really endanger these beautiful species. And even today, sea turtles are still some of the largest living reptiles. So these are the three main species that we have here in Florida. We have loggerheads, which I think are gonna be start nesting here in just a few months. We have green turtles, and then we have leatherbacks. Have any of you seen any of these? Which one? Oh, beautiful, okay. Um, so we don't quite have all of the nesting data for 2021 yet, um, but in 2020, we had 173 nests in Florida um, from the loggerhead species. In 2020, we had 26,657 nests of green sea turtles. And in 2020, we had uh, 1,652 nests of the leatherback sea turtle. I'm gonna get into why it's important that these um, numbers come into play when talking about hatchlings and herding just one nesting female. Okie dokie. So we also have four other species of sea turtles. These do not come um, into Florida quite often, although we do have some rare hawksbill and Kemp's Ridley. Um, now, all of these turtles are also affected by artificial light, just not on the Florida coast. Um, hawksbills were also poached for their beautiful shell known to make jewelry and earrings and um, all of that kind of stuff. Kemp's Ridleys, um, they are what I like to call like the grandparents of the sea. They're one of the smallest, they're the smallest species. Um, Olive Ridleys are their direct um, companion. They're my favorite, second favorite species. Um, and then your flatback, which only is off the coast of Australia. All right, so a little bit about their life, cy life cycle. So they have their near shore habitats, they're mating, they're nesting when they leave the beach and then they're open ocean. I don't think we have a slide here for, um, oh, we do for mating. Nope. nope. Okay. So um, in, in Florida, female um, sea turtles will crawl up from the beach usually at night um, and deposit around 70 to 140 eggs about three to five times in nesting season. So in the summer months, um, May to October and March to October, they'll come up on shore about five times. And like I said, they will repeatedly nest. Um, they'll deposit about 70 to 140 eggs, about two feet deep. Um, they prefer to do this in relatively dark areas, such as dunes, um, away from artificial light. And because of this, they can be decidedly picky of where they want. They can come up many times in one night um, and do these things called false crawls, where they come up and just like crawl around a little bit and then decide that they don't like that area. And then they'll go over here and they might like dig an egg chamber and then they don't like it. So then they'll just crawl back. Um, so they are very picky when it comes to where they want to lay their eggs because sea turtles aren't um, maternal or parental. Um, they just leave behind a yolk sac, which means that that's like their, um, it's kind of going to nourish the embryo until they get out to sea. Um, so they are very picky. And then about 55 days after they nest, um, they emerge um, they leave the beach and then they will be crawling to the open ocean. So we're gonna do another one. So when they leave the beach, I know a lot of these photos are taken during the daytime, but they tend to hatch and nest at night. Um, they like to run away in big numbers because it stops the predators. It's easier to make it if you're in a group of, you know, a hundred than a couple. Um, and then once they get to the surf, which they also face predators such as ghost crabs and birds and sometimes people, um, then they have to survive in the ocean. So they'll swim for about 24 hours until they get to the open ocean. Look how cute. Um, so they have to one, be hatched through the nest, two, make it from the nest to the ocean and then just keep swimming and swimming and swimming. So they have not an easy first couple of days, especially not an easy first couple of hours. And then um, they get to the open ocean, also known as their lost years. They kind of just go and disappear and feed and um, hopefully camouflage like this loggerhead. 
Um, and this is where they will stay until they get back into their near shore habitats and mating season. All right, now the fun part. So we have a lot of threats when it comes to protecting sea turtles. We have climate change, nest disturbance, marine debris, pollution, oil spills, bycatch, illegal poaching, boat strikes, dogs, and our favorite, light pollution. So I'm going to get into... Um, so sea turtles can get caught in um, fishing gear, like um, commercial fishing. They take those big nets and kind of suck everything up. And sea turtles are um, one of the species that get caught a lot. And since they are an air species, they can only be underwater for so long. Plus when they're stressed, they just end up drowning in those nets. So that's a big problem with entanglement. Then we have poaching. Um, this isn't such a problem in Florida, but since um, sea turtles are a migratory species, they don't just live in Florida waters. They, they live in Panama, Costa Rica, and Australia. So um, what we do in Florida can also help those species, but poaching is a problem. They kill them for green turtle steaks, um, their shells, their eggs, and stuff like that. So I'm thinking this is a picture from Costa Rica or Panama. Um, it's just, they come in, what? They come in to take the eggs and um, they kind of will eat them raw or they'll put them in bakery goods. They add a good fluff. I've never tried them. I don't recommend it. Okay. All righty. Uh-oh. You can go next slide. Okay, so this is some plastic. Um, it looks like it was from 2020. Um, so I'm sure if you ever walk the beach, you can see like little pieces of plastic, like bottle cap lids or um, plastic straws, all of that terrible stuff. Um, and you may think it just impacts big sea turtles, but it doesn't. Um, we also have post hatchlings, which are called washbacks. They've been out for a few months. Um, and you can see that all of this plastic was just inside this little turtle. Um, and it's very sad because it's, that's a lot of plastic and it's just, it doesn't have to be that way. Okie dokie. And then we have some climate change. So um, that doesn't look good, no. And I'm pretty sure you wouldn't really want a house up here. Your house is gonna um, sink. So climate change, we have really bad storms and hurricanes, which wash away nests. Um, we also have erosion taking on in this picture, knocking down all those cinder blocks. Um, climate change is a real problem because sea turtles are temperature dependent species, which means that hot chicks, cool dudes, um, so warmer of the temperature, the more likely it is to be a female um, and colder sand temperature is more likely to be male. So if we're having climate change and we're having warmer weather, um, that temperature of the sand is going to be producing a lot of females and you need both parties to reproduce. So if we only have females, we have no males, we have no hatchlings. Um, so climate change is, is a problem that's not affecting the habitat, but also the reproductiveness. Um, sea walls are also a problem. Um, this is also known as coastal armoring. This is what a lot of um, areas try to do to protect their houses and properties from storms. Not understanding that when that water washes up and hits this going to eat away all of that sand and then it's just going to cause one of those big sinkholes like in that last photo so I mean I don't even want to use the word recommended they're not recommended but they would only be used in the most necessary of, of events and aspects there's other things you can do I mean you can do dune plantings um you can put in natural vegetation you don't need coastal armoring I just really don't like this <laughs> okie dokie um so like I said we have had all of those natural um, we actually have 90% of all loggerhead nesting in the world on our Florida coast since the population declined in Oman. Um, so what we do effectively in Florida does not only enhance our turtle species, it also helps all of those migratory species as well. Um, so that was, it, we want to take care of our turtles. Okie dokie. So like I said, despite some of those daytime photos of turtles swimming and laying eggs on the beach and crawling, most of their um, habitat and you know life on sand takes place at night. So it's really important that the lights are turned off. Um, sea turtles dig the dark for many reasons. Um, and they specifically dig the dark because when they're trying to return to the sea, 
they follow the natural cues of the bright moon and the surf of the waves away from the relatively dark dune. So if you're shining um, bright lights, that's gonna deter them from going to the ocean and into backyards and on roadways like those photos I showed earlier. Now this is a dream. We love to see, um, this is a loggerhead sea turtle on a relatively dark, um, you can see that there's no sky glow and that thing returning um, back to the ocean. So this is what we attempt for every species of sea turtle. But um, I know we have some turtle people with us today. Um, I spoke with them earlier saying that they have seen um, hatchling sea turtles go away from the water. Um, but in this photo, you can see that all of these little baby hatchling tracks are going towards the water. This is what we want. Um, and this is because they were following that white moon, the stars, and the surf of the waves. But in... All right, but in this photo, um, where would you think that the turtles would go? So if, if the hatchling were to come up here in 55 days and you were a turtle and you were like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna go towards the brightest part, where, where would you go? Light. You wanted to go towards the light? Um, do you think that that light is gonna deter them away from like the, the moon? Um, it, it most likely will. Um, so we have some ways that we can fix that condo, but this is what normally happens. Um, this is just a study from um, Witherington in 1992, just saying that in the black square, there um, was higher rates of nesting on relatively darker beaches. And in the red square that when you had those artificial lights and the mercury vapor, um, the nesting um, really decreased. So it's just showing that there was a study that proves that darker beaches are better for sea turtles. So I spoke about this earlier when I was saying that turtles are allowed to be decidedly picky. Um, this turtle came up and it was like wanting to lay a nest, but it probably saw a white light or some artificial lights or heard a sound um, or got spooked. And this is what I mean when I say I talk about false crawls. Um, turtles can leave a bunch of these a night. I mean, some nights you can see 50 of these and not a single nest. And there's many reasons to that. But I would probably rather have a false crawl than this loggerhead sea turtle end up on the street. Um, this is just a really unfortunate circumstance of what happens probably nightly that just a lot of people don't see. Um, and my guess would be that this was also a dune-ish area and then this was the water and it came up and it just kept following that light. It could have been from a pole light on the road, could have been from a car headlight, could have been from somebody walking. It only takes one light to disorient a sea turtle. Um, but let's hope that female got back to the water. Um, and it's not just adult turtles that suffer this consequence of artificial light and human behavior. It is also these hatchlings. Um, so that other photo I showed you, I was showing you that all those hatchling tracks were crawling towards the water. And where are they going in this photo? Not where they're supposed to. Um, so what we can assume is that there was a house or a property or somebody with a bright white light um, and that those hatchling turtles at night, I mean, it could have been midnight to 4 a.m. anytime and they just distracted. And it's really bad for these hatchlings because they're only, I don't want to say they only come with, but they only have so much energy reserves. And from crawling out of that nest, which can take days, and then, you know, taking a mad dash down to the ocean and then swimming for 24 hours straight, they need that precious energy not to be wasted, you know, following all of these, these lights. Um, so this is another picture. That one was what we call a misorientation where they're misorienting, going in the right direction. This is what we call a disorientation. When those hatch just come out and they're just in a frenzy and they're like, where do I wanna go? Um, so both of these are very harmful to hatchlings because they don't make it to the water. And they end up like this. Um, yeah, it's not fun when you're walking the beach and you see a hatchling get swept away from a bird. Um, but this is the reality when they use up all those energy reserves and they don't have any um, energy left to make that crawl to the ocean. They get picked away pretty easily. And then, um, so you may ask, why do we not, you can go, oh, 
And then they will end up like this. Um, this could be from a misorient or a disorient where they end up in a backyard. Hopefully none of you have had that before. So you may ask, why do we not um, relocate these eggs? Um, we know that what the problem is, it's lighting. Why don't we move them to a darker area of the beach? Um, well, like I said, they're, te they're temperature sex dependent. So if we take those eggs, um, we're altering the natural sex cues. Also, I showed you images of poachers um, and storms. So if we put you know, 80 nests into like a square mile and a storm comes, we lose all of those 80 nests. And if a poacher finds them, we lose all of that. So although there are um, disadvantages of leaving the eggs where they are, such as misorient and disorientations, um, moving them can also be just as tragic if we lose all of those nests and not just one. And that is my end. Um, my boss, Rachel Ty, is gonna be taking over, going over three simple ways to fix artificial light. Um, and thank you. Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right, so Casey talked about all these awful things that can happen to sea turtles and talking about how light can affect them. So we're gonna talk about the ways to mitigate all those awful things. Um, so back in the day, uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, uh, biologists, conservationists, technical advisors all got together and they created what they call the three rules of sea turtle friendly lighting. So I wanna preface this with, even though we use this term sea turtle friendly lighting very loosely, the best light for sea turtles is no light whatsoever. So sea turtle friendly lighting is just kind of a compromise. And um, again, best light is no light. It's just a marketing term to help people understand and change your lights and what's more realistic. So preface it with that. So let's talk about these three rules. The first rule is to keep it low. And what that means is to actually keep the light low to the ground. So it's, um, less likely to be visible from the beach and then using um, light in applications where you need it to be. So the idea is to keep the light low to the ground um, where the light again needs to actually be shining in a lot of these um, instances. So in this image, you can see that as you lower the light, it creates more um, habitat and environment for some of these species at nighttime, such as owls and bats, insects, um, and even this coyote in the background there. and do it to me too. I felt like I was doing so good. <laughs> All right, so this is an example of um, some poorly managed lights around a pool deck and um, a condominium up in the panhandle. Oh, no, too fast. What's happening? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. All right, you guys just got a sneak peek of what you're gonna see. All right, and that first image we like to call those lollipop lights or globe lights. They're really hideous. They don't do what they're supposed to do. They send the light in every direction. Um, the second image is what it looked like after it was retrofitted using um, sea turtle friendly lighting. It was a pool area, so they did need pole lights for safety reasons. For the health and safety department, you have to meet certain codes, but they were um, shielded and they were um, pool cut off as well. Then they also used in the wall, you can see that those are recessed lights um, and they're mounted low to the ground. They have louvers that also points the light down to the ground. So we'd consider that well managed. Um, up lights, up lights are such a big thing. Everyone loves their up lights. It makes the property look beautiful, but it's awful for sea turtles. It's awful for um, sky glow. It's just really bad and honestly um, contributes a lot to light pollution. So usually they're to light a path and kind of let people know where they're walking. So um, this is what it looked like using some lower lights to the ground, pointing the light to the actual sidewalk where it needed to be for safety. And then these are just some other examples of keep it low fixtures. Um, that bottom what you, right picture is of a pole light, it's shielded. Um, so in some cases you have to use poles depending on if it's a parking lot or whatnot, but it's still that pole is only 12 feet tall. So the second rule is to keep it shielded. So this image just kind of depicts on kind of what we discussed earlier about wasted light use being used in the wrong application. So you can see the very first um, picture is just kind of like one of those lollipop or globe lights where the light's going everywhere. 
Um, if you skip down to the one that says better, that is a full cutoff fixture, which means that no light is emitted above a 90 degree angle. Um, this is better. Um, and in some cases, this is what has to be used in the parking lot or whatnot to meet certain foot candles for safety. But the best thing to use is a shielded fixture, which is on um, the very end on the far right. So it's directing the light downward. The person standing under the, under the light is still visible. Um, and he's still able to walk without um, that excess light pollution. So here's um, an example of a poorly managed light. We see these a lot. It's um, a nautical light fixture that's actually, I think, intended to be a um, ceiling mounted fixture. And uh, this is a uh, shielded fixture used there after the fact. Uh, and then if you'll also know it's very, very small at the bottom for those of you who are here in person, but um, it also has uh, meter readers, meter, meter readings that we took before and after the retrofit. So you can see before um, it was 0 0.1350 foot candles and then after um, it dropped down to 0 0.069. So it also reduces again, that unnecessary um, light pollution and using light where it needs to be used, where it's needed. I'm scared to press it too many times. Here we go. So this is another example, example of poorly managed lights. Um, so these are low mounted fixtures. So at first glance, you think they'd be okay. Even if they had an amber light though, it still wouldn't be the best scenario because that backside is not shielded. So if you're looking at it from the beach at night, even though there's dunes there, it's still raised up above the beach. You can still see that light. The suspense, there we go. <laughs> Um, so that's what um, it looks like using shielded fixtures. This was taken a while um, after um, this initial picture. So you can see there's more vegetation, but there's shields on the back side of those fixtures. So it doesn't illuminate the dunes unnecessarily. And then here is another example of um, a poor, some poorly managed lights. And just some examples of what they might look like well managed. I will say that first one uh, or the bottom left photo um, with those nautical lights on the dune crossover. Most places don't allow dune crossover lights anymore. We don't recommend them. Um, but if they're absolutely you know, avid on using them, there are some solutions that still aren't the best solution, but they're a solution. Uh, I, we always like to show this picture. So these are again, those nautical lights on the ceiling. Um, you can see what it looks like before, but after when you put in cylinder down lights um, and it's shielded, you can see that it's still very well lit. Honestly, it may be the light is probably better distributed now. And the only reason why you can tell how many actual fixtures are there now is by looking at those circles on the ground where the light's going. And the last and final rule is to keep it long. And by that, we are um, referring to wavelength. So to really understand what we mean by keeping it long is really to understand the principles of light altogether. Um, we see white light as a whole, but visible light is composed of very many different colors. And you can kind of think about how they're broken up either in this prism or this, this rainbow. When you think of rainbow, what we all know is Roy G. Biv. Um, and so if you think about those top arcs that are red, orange, and yellow, they are going to be longer. Kind of helps you remember that when you look at this electromagnetic spectrum, whenever we get there. <laughs> there we go. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. So when we talk about wavelength, you really have to understand, um, understand this. So on the electromagnetic spectrum, there is visible light. So that top bar is that whole electromagnetic spectrum. The bottom um, just shows visible light on there. So that's what we can actually see of wavelength. Um, and so wavelength um, in terms of what is visible to us, it's around 400 nanometers and nanometers is just the measurement um, of visible light. So 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. c trillo friendly lighting is right in between 560 to 700. So when you think about what c trillo friendly light is, some of you guys might be thinking, oh, yellow or orange or red. That's why it's that color is uh, it's long wavelength and it falls there on visible light. So it's not just the color alone, it's the actual wavelength of the light, which is really 
important to remember. So long wavelength being 560 nanometers or longer. Not to be confused with Kelvin temperature. So um, why is this important to sea turtles? <laughs> well, sea turtles vision uh, actually differs from our own and that they're only capable um, of seeing within this narrow shifted range of the visible light spectrum um, with evidence suggesting that they can see um, some into the ultraviolet range as well. So the wavelength of light rather than the color of light is what's important because sea turtles and many other animals are highly attracted to these short wavelengths of light. So uh, this was a study also done um, by Dr. Blair Witherington. You'll hear that name a lot. He's kind of considered breaking when it came to learning about long wavelengths of light. He did a lot of research on light and sea turtles. So this particular study, um, he looked at different species of sea turtles and their attraction to um, light. And what he found was that loggerheads were actually, in this particular study, Florida's loggerheads were aversive to um, yellow light, meaning that they weren't attracted to it. And um, the rest of them were kind of indifferent to this um, long wavelength light. So they were not attracted to this long wavelength light is what he found in the study. Whereas below that 560, so this is where that magic 560 nanometer came from was the study um, all these sea turtles showed, showed attraction, all these um, species showed, showed attraction to shorter wavelengths. So these are some examples of bad light, short wavelength lights, um, and what they look like through a spectroscope. So um, that bottom band is the colors from basically that electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, that visible light that is seen in these folds. So you'll see that they all have kind of full spectrum light, meaning that you can see a lot of those different colors in them. So these aren't good, these are bad. And these are examples of um, what we consider sea turtle friendly. So you'll see that the red LED is actually the best. The longer the wavelength, the better, but most people don't like red light on their homes and properties. So that's why Amber has been kind of the compromise, but you'll see that out of all these, Amber is one that actually has some green in it. Um, and that's right at that kind of 560 nanometer mark. So you wouldn't want to go any more yellow than that. But that is why um, so many people refer to this amber color is because it's long wavelength and it's more acceptable to people to put on their homes. People don't want to put red lights on their houses. Um, and then I do want to make a note that low pressure sodium while on here is being phased out. So we don't recommend people use um, low pressure sodium, that they use LED lights. That's really the only way you can achieve this wavelength for the most part. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're giving anyone recommendations or looking to change lights in your own house, that that's not the way to go. So recapping those three rules, the best light to use is a light that meets all three of those rules and fits the application. So it's low to the ground, It's shielded and it uses that long wavelength that we discussed. And then I think pictures are worth a thousand words. So here is a before and after for you guys to look at, at a property that was retrofitted. This was Marco Island. Um, so before, again, you can see those meter readings on the bottom of the picture. These were taken from the beach. So this is actually two different properties. Between the two properties, there were four buildings two pools, two parking garages, and four parking lots in addition to those parking garages. So um, they were actually causing a lot of disorientation. So they were being um, dinged by code enforcement. And you'll see that um, before they were at 0 0.035 and then after from the beach, they went down to 0 0.003. That's a, that's a big deal. I know it's like seems minuscule, but it's a big deal. These massive properties, you know, turning that way. And the great thing about these properties is they became keystone properties to the community. So more people were excited about doing this. So, and then I just want to go over some benefits with you guys. And then I think we're going to be done here. So Casey mentioned earlier about how other wildlife are um, affected by lights. And that is true. And so Using sea turtle friendly lighting also means that you protect other wildlife. 
So um, artificial light disrupts bat foraging behavior. Uh, many species will actually avoid these brightly lit areas, which decreases in pollination of valuable crops. Uh, millions of bird each, birds each year die from exhaustion um, by, or um, collisions close to bright sources of lights. Uh, moths are especially vulnerable to artificial lights uh, and swarm in bright light, white lights and aren't, um, are unable to escape. And then um, species such as fireflies that rely on bioluminescence for communication are losing their habitat because of artificial light as well. So changing your lights also means that this is better for other species. Let me pull a Casey here. <laughs> um, Changing your lights can also bring you into compliance. So what many of you may not know is that about 82 governments, local governments, counties and municipalities actually have um, lighting ordinances that uh, people who live in those areas are supposed to follow. And um, they're there to protect sea turtles. So changing your lights also means that maybe you won't get a code violation or a fee that you have to pay. So it brings you into compliance with local code. Yes, Cocoa Beach is on there. <laughs> I think I can stop, they stop. Um, it can also help um, with safety and security. So uh, that's one myth that we hear a lot is that my property is gonna be less safe if I change my lights. And that is absolutely false. You can meet building code, um, the health and safety department regulations, you can meet recommendations made by the um, Illuminating Engineer Engineering Society, which most people follow that um, in terms of light code, like the Florida building code follows a lot of that. So you can meet all of those things using sea turtle friendly lights. You just have to use them in the right way. So your property can still be secure. A lot of times because the light's being directed downward, you're getting more light onto the ground. Um, it looks more pleasant. And when used properly, you get better distribution, which eliminates those scary shadows that people can hide in. Uh, it also can save on your energy. Um, I know that some properties we've worked on reported up to a 75% decrease in their electrical bill. Um, and that's because again, Sea turtle friendly lights use mostly LED um, LEDs. So you're saving on energy in that regard. And this is subjective, but it's also can be viewed as being very beautiful. Uh, this was actually, we did not take these pictures. They came from um, a property that was retrofitted up in Destin and they were so excited about it that um, they were featured in their local newspaper. Um, as being beautiful and contributing to the area. So it can also be really good for ecotourism and just seen as beautiful. Um, a lot of people say it kind of gives this resort candle, candle um, um, ambiance feel. Oops. This one's important. Casey mentioned this earlier. It also is good for your health. So the word that you were looking for was circadian ry rhythm. <laughs> um, it can help with your circadian rhythm and help you sleep at night. It can also help you, um, uh, uh, artificial light can also um, contribute to obesity. So it can help you with your weight um, and not only sleep. And it can just also help with your mood as well. There's been studies to show that too much light can um, affect your mood and make you a not so pleasant person to be around. So sea turtles you know, are helped by uh, sea turtle friendly lighting and so are we. So we've talked about these benefits. We've talked about sea turtle lights. Um, there's this kind of gap about where can I find sea turtle friendly lights? Um, well, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, they uh, kind of vet lights and list them on their webpage as to whether or not they've been sea turtle friendly and they certify them. So you can go on their website and find all these different fixtures um, that can be used on different properties. Uh, that's actually what Casey used to do at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So if you guys have questions about that, feel free to um, ask her. But uh, there is a brief gap that I want to mention after this is once you go there and you see them and you know what you can use, it's hard to buy them. So we recommend going to a local lighting distributor 
um, and using, you can't walk into like a Lowe's or Home Depot and get them. You have to go to like an actual local electrical or lighting distributor in the area. Um, and you can tell them what they want and they, what you want and they can order it for you. Oh, here we go. Um, so again, uh, uh, on this page, it often takes you to the manufacturer's page, but doesn't have a place for you to actually purchase it online. So that is why I said that. Sometimes a manufacturer will let you buy directly from them, but more often than not, they won't. I'd say 90% of the lights you have to buy somewhere. Um, so just keep that in mind. You can always use a contractor as well if you're having someone install it and let them buy it for you, but it's gonna save you money in the long run if you know what you want up front um, and you tell them what you want and you go to a distributor because each one of these layers puts their own markup on it. So if a lighting distributor gets it from the manufacturer, they're gonna mark it up from the manufacturer cost. And if the contractor gets it from the lighting distributor, they're gonna mark it up. So going straight to that lighting distributor is usually the best way. And then we also have um, a ton of outreach on lighting. If anyone's interested, we have some in the car, we didn't bring it, lug it all the way out here, but if anyone's interested, we're happy to give you some. And here's some of the different things that we offer. Um, the one that I really wanna highlight is this postcard. I don't know if flashlights or temporary lights are a big deal here on the beach, but um, these are actually postcards that you can send through the mail. Um, so they're kind of a fun little take home for people who are on vacation um, that talks about not using flashlights on the beach. And just to kind of recap on ways you can help is use a wildlife friendly lighting on your home. Make sure you turn off your exterior lights, close your blinds um, when visiting beachfront properties and staying there. And um, don't use flashlights or cell phone lights on the beach at night. And I can talk to you guys about that later after this. But that is it. Um, so I know that went a little bit long. Do we have time for questions or? <laughs> I think we do have some time for questions, but okay. just some quick housekeeping before we do that. We have some people online that have been posting some questions, so I'll kind of bounce back and forth. I will ask that you raise your hand if you have a question so that uh, Rachel can repeat that question to the people listening online, because unfortunately they can't hear you if you're attending here in person and they really want to know what your questions are as well. Um, so if someone online, or I'm sorry, if someone in the room has a question, just go ahead and repeat it before you answer that question so everyone can hear you. Sounds good. Um, yes. I don't think I need this. People. Yes, in the back. So basically the question was, when you buy a bulb in a store, most of the time it's listed um, by the Kelvin temperature. And is there a way to essentially convert Kelvin over to wavelength? No, <laughs> um, in short. Um, but I think that's a good point to bring up is that Kelvin and wavelength are two separate things. Um, all sea turtle friendly light is a lower um, Kelvin, but not all lower Kelvin is sea turtle friendly. Some lower Kelvin still full spectrum. So it is um, good to make sure that you're using a long wavelength light. Uh, most of the time, these bulbs are special order. You have to order them specially. Uh, there's some stores and some Ace Hardwares that kind of carry these, but it just depends on that specific location. But something you can look for, um, as we mentioned, is that FWC certifies fixtures and bulbs, and they have um, the certification logo. Here, actually, let me see that and go back. <laughs> um, they have this logo, and then they also have a certification number that goes with it. So it's good to look for that logo. And if you're not sure, because some people market them falsely saying that they're sea turtle friendly and they're not, it should go along with a certification number. So that logo there in the corner and it should have a certification number and it, the certification number starts with the year it was certified. FWC is kind of in this lull right now because um, of COVID. So they haven't been certifying things. So anything from probably 2018 to now is okay. But it's usually every two years things get recertified. Um, before I answer, do you have any online that I need to answer or? Yeah. We have one question from someone online. They're asking if you can explain what a foot candle means and how do they know if they need, how do they know what foot candles are required? Perfect. Yeah. Um, so foot candle is just a, um, a type of measurement on light. It's really how many, how much light is reaching the ground essentially. Um, IES that I mentioned before, they use that measurement a lot. Um, 
if you have building code, you can go in. So pool areas have a um, certain measurement they have to meet, um, and that's the health and safety department. Or um, what am I missing? Yeah, egress points. Egress points have certain areas. So entrances and exits need to be lit um, to one foot candle um, average. Uh, but that all should be written either in your local government's building code. And if it's not, then you look at the floor of the building code for um, those sort of things. And then for pool areas, it's through the health and safety department. So you have to kind of go to all these different places and pull together what it is. There's unfortunately not one easy manual to look at. All right, somebody else had, yes. Why can't we buy a beaker like it at base and home depot? The question was, why can't you buy Citrilla Friendly Lighting at Ace Hardware or Home Depot or Lowe's? And that is a fantastic question. We have been trying to get them to carry it, especially for these places that um, are updating their ordinances and require people to have these types of lights. Well, there's this problem to where people can't go get them anywhere, especially if they don't know anything about local lighting distributors. Before I did this job, I'm gonna be honest. I was like, what's a local lighting distributor? I'm just gonna to go to Home Depot or Lowe's to get this stuff. So we actually are starting on this initiative to try and get some coastal stores to start carrying this stuff or at least have it available to order. Um, it's not a restriction. I mean, it might be certain manufacturers that they are able to carry, but there's plenty of manufacturers out there that now make sea turtle friendly lights. So it's really just the lack of knowledge and them needing to be open to learning about it. But uh, we're working on it because that's where most people go. And so they need to have those lights there as well. That's a good question. Yes. So um, it was it was a comment that um, a gentleman online uh, found some supposed sea turtle friendly bulbs um, on Amazon and that you might be able to find them that way. Um, you can. I wouldn't recommend going that route because you can't sort of you can't guarantee that they are actually truly long way. Not everything has to be certified to be sea turtle friendly. So that's something to mention. But it's if you're not sure, it's always good to go that route. Well, let me know and I'll, I'll tell, I'll, uh, let me know if you can remember the brand and I'll tell you if it is. <laughs> um, but yes, good point. Do you have any more questions online? Yes, Casey. Absolutely. Um, so Casey's question was, can you explain color filters and why they aren't sea turtle friendly? Um, so again, just because a light looks red doesn't mean it's that long wavelength. So a filter doesn't actually change the wavelength of the light. Um, it just changes the, changes the color of the light. So again, that's why it's important to know um, the wavelength and not necessarily the color. So not all red, orange, and amber lights are truly long wavelength. All right, online. <laughs> um, so we have someone online asking, are there devices that are able to be purchased to determine whether a light is too bright or within the appropriate range, meaning something like Maybe like a speed radar gun, but for a light? Yes, I, I would say it depends on who you are as to whether or not I'd recommend buying it. But um, there's light, light meter readers that you can use to measure foot candles. There's spectrometers that can measure wavelength. Um, I will say with spectrometers, uh, you have to be right up against a light, preferably in a dark room. Well, that's not really doable on the beach. So you have to be right up next to a light to really look at um, that measurement. Um, there's also devices that um, can measure sky glow, um, which is a sky quality meter. Uh, so it just depends on what you're trying to measure. There's different devices for that. Yes. Yeah, I know which one. It, yes. But then it went back up on the red. Maybe. I was <laughs> <laughs> just curious because I thought red would go faster. Of course, now the clicker's working. Uh, uh, <laughs> you spoke too soon. <laughs> 
has to be like just right in the sweet spot here. This one. Um, it could have just, you're talking about the Hawks bill there or no, the loggerhead, the loggerhead. It's been a long time since I've read this paper. I'm going to be honest. It could be something to do with the sample size. It could have been an outlier that did that. I mean, if their sample size was six hatch hatchlings, you know, if four of them went up there, it's going to jump up. So I don't know, but it's still close to that indifference line. Um, and I wish I would have read the paper recently. Do you remember? It's possible maybe there was another source of light, Casey said. Um, I don't think that was the case in that because that one was set up with like a little arena, essentially. Um, so it could have just been sample size. Yeah. I don't know. I'll have to look at the paper. So if somebody asks me that again, I can answer it better. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Okay. The question was, um, is our local ordinances year round or are they only really an active, um, active during nesting season? And I would say it depends on your area. Um, most of them are for just nesting season and whatever nesting the season, season is defined as your, um, by, as your, uh, by your local government as. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, so it just, it just depends. Um, Cocoa Beach, it's just during nesting season. Um, I can only think of maybe two places out of the 80 something local governments that have ordinances that do it year round. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, another question. There, there's some discussion in the ones that we know about whether or not we should allow fireworks or not. My personal, the, the question was, there's been some discussion about whether or not fireworks should be allowed during um, nesting season during Cocoa Beach and what do I think? My personal opinion is no, not to use them. Um, they cause a lot of distraction, they cause a lot of unnecessary people on the beach, it causes a lot of um, trash on the beach um, and those types of events as well, um, among other things. So we, as an organization, say no, don't do fireworks. I don't know what the city of Cocoa Beach's stance is, and I don't want to speak for them. So <laughs> any other questions? Yes. The question was, who can you contact if you see someone during nesting season using flashlights or something during the beach? I do not believe your ordinance actually restricts people from using temporary lights. So in that case, depending on the person and how you feel about it, the best thing to do would really just be to offer some polite education. And if you don't feel safe or you don't think they're gonna be receptive, then it just kind of is, unfortunately. It's something that we're trying to get more people to adopt in their ordinances, um, but there's still a lot of debate about lights because you know, a lot of um, a lot of people want lights on the beach in terms of flashlights for their safety, especially if you know they're elderly. So in those cases, we suggest people use long wavelength and only use it when going up and down stairs. But there was a question as to whether or not they make long wavelength flashlights. They do. Um, a lot of the actual red LED flashlights that you can buy in the store, if you measure them, are usually long wavelength. Um, the problem is there's um, a lot of the public out there doesn't necessarily know about sea turtles and that it's not good to shine lights in their face. So there's a lot of images and I don't have them in this presentation, but there's a lot of images of people actually shining flashlights on sea turtles and causing issues and harm to them in that way. So that's why we don't recommend using them. But if you absolutely have to use them or if we have to use them when we're doing work on the beach, we use long wavelength red LED flashlights. There's a question online. Okay. Um, someone has just made a comment saying that they live oceanfront and they've noticed multiple people, you know, walking along the beach at night, flashlights, noticing that they might be visitors, not locals. Mm -hmm. um, and they're wondering, do you have any literature or communication with hotels to educate visitors? 
Um, do I need to repeat all that? I think they heard me. Okay, good. good. <laughs> um, we have uh, some materials that postcard that I mentioned uh, previously uh, is geared towards visitors because it usually is visitors. Quite honestly, looking for ghost crabs at night is usually the problem. They're using their flashlights to catch ghost crabs and then do nothing with them and release them. Um, so there is some information on that. It's still kind of this, this new emerging threat though. So there isn't a lot of outreach material on it. Am I missing something? I think we're kind of the first organization that's done something more massive like a postcard. I know there's some areas that do, um, I think Volusia County does like a flashlight check-in and check-out at resorts where you can check, check out a red LED flashlight before going on the beach. Um, it's up to really the resort to make that successful. So if they don't stick with it, it doesn't really make it successful. So there's not a lot out there. A lot of it's just gonna come from talking to people and it's gonna come from really whether or not local governments adopt that because if they don't adopt it, it's kind of hard to enforce it. Time for one more. One more question from someone? Perfect. Thank All you. All right, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Good job. Give these ladies a nice round of applause like you already are. They did awesome. They're really the experts in all of these lighting restrictions, uh, lighting ordinances and things. And I do want to let you all know that here in Cocoa Beach, we're working to improve a lot of the things that you guys are bringing up tonight. People having flashlights on the beach, our ordinance being a little more robust um, so that it's, you know, a, a, people can easily understand and also beefing up that education, letting people know what's going on. Um, so thank you so much for coming out. Make sure you join us on March 15th, where we'll be discussing um, restoring lagoon inflow um, with Dr. Jeff Ebel from FIT. He's going to be talking about really moving that ocean water into the lagoon and how that might impact the lagoon benefits, um, maybe some negatives to that and all of the above. So thank you all for coming out. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay.